Uh, thanks, Brigitte and Kia ora. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, as Brigitte has said, I returned to Aotearoa, New Zealand uh, late last year to take up a role here at this university, a very grandly titled role, the Provost. <laughs> I'm a feminist geographer by background. I'm known for my critical research on neoliberalism and globalisation. And in recent years, I've regularly experienced my friends and colleagues dragging me to one side and basically reading the riot act to me. What the hell are you doing? Why is someone like you going into management? And you have to imagine the rolling of the eyes and the sneering and the, um, uh, the, the, the tone with which that is being said. So I want to begin by very publicly saying, uh, to use Leone's phrase, putting my voice on the line, that um, the fact that I am now doing institutional work rather than my political academic research and writing doesn't mean I've given up my critical sensibilities and academic analysis. Indeed, I don't think I could do this job in the way that I want to do those job, this job without that sensibility and without that analysis. So what I want to do in the time that I've got is reflect on some of the changes that I see happening in universities around the world, including here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and outline what I think this means for the academic activist interface. What I'm really interested in are the new modes of contact that are beginning to emerge, just as Sue has described, between academics, between practitioners, between activists that increasingly characterise our institutions. One of my Bristol friends and colleagues describes this as turning the university inside out. How are we going to turn the university inside out? Now, when the academic literature talks about this, and, and I'm, I'm uh, a guilty party to this, there's huge amounts of talk about the neoliberal university, uh, academic capitalism, and I don't want to dwell on that literature this morning. What I want to do is push our analysis beyond the realms of marketisation, competitiveness, individualisation that lots being said about, to talk about another way in which the university is being turned inside out. Because in addition to the marketisation and commodification that there has been so much talk about, there has been much, much less talk about other sites from which new relationships between universities and external partners are being built. And what I'm thinking about are sites like women's studies, indigenous studies, development studies, community development, all places where people have been working for many decades to build new relationships between universities, between communities, between activists and academia. Now here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we know this better than most because we know about the importance and profile of kaupapa Māori. We know about the influence of indigenous scholars like Linda Tuawai Smith already mentioned this morning and the emphasis in all our institutions on Maturanga Māori. So what I want to say from the academic perspective is that we haven't paid enough attention to these very long-standing efforts to facilitate interactions that are characterised by relationships of solidarity and reciprocity rather than the individualised and instrumental market-oriented relations of neoliberalism. Now, all of us in this room understand, indeed embody, this emphasis on solidarity and reciprocity. In our worlds, 
the demand to build external relationship operates in the name of various publics. Our research traditions are not premised on instrumental relationships between academics and external stakeholders, but on deep interpersonal relationships that aim to produce socially significant knowledge premised on a reciprocal understanding of the expertise and insights of all partners in the research process. This is the terrain that Sue's working on. This is the terrain that many of us, if not all of us, in the room in one way or another will be working on, because that's what brings us into this room. There's more talk than you might think in universities about this terrain. And what I want to do is rehearse three broad trends, starting from the, the, um, the, the one that sort of looks most institutionalised and working my way to the ones that I think are more familiar to us. First of all, it will probably be of no surprise to you that many universities now are explicitly talking about engagement. It's the, the term of the moment, if you like. So, for example, here at Victoria, we now have a Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Engagement who's explicitly charged with building external relationships. And these aren't just relationships with business. And we have to keep reminding them of that, and we have to keep pushing that, but they aren't just relationships with businesses. All universities have begun to pay much more attention to the external audiences, and I'm going to problematise that term, the external audiences for their academic research. Now, the reason for this shift towards engagement is not straightforward. We, we could do a, a very interesting genealogy of that, and I'm not going to try and do it. But on one hand, it's about the critique of the ivory tower. You know, you academics stuck up here on the hill, you know, in your libraries doing your work. Why don't you tell us what you're doing? It's also about the changing priorities of government and funders who are asking really big questions about the role that universities play. But it's also about demands for greater accountability of academics by various publics. So public lectures, science fairs, open days, pub talks, festivals, all these kinds of activities have become part of a lexicon of a new cohort of what we might think about as engaged academics. There are also much stronger collaborations between universities and community and cultural institutions. I raced up here this morning from Te Papa, where a, uh, the Human Rights Commission, the University and Te Papa are collaborating on an initiative and an event. It's helped by the growth of open access publishing, uh, the ways in which wider audiences for academic writing are being found. Now, the interesting thing about this challenge, and again, it harkens back to Sue's point, we didn't know what each other were going to say, but it fits together very nicely. In this model, academics have knowledge, and they somehow share that knowledge with their publics. So we're getting out of the ivory tower, but there's still that sense that the academics have the knowledge. So the second strand I want to point to uh, gets talked about sometimes as knowledge transfer or knowledge exchange. And again, there's quite a long genealogy to this. It's a complicated genealogy. It includes things like technology transfer and translational medicine. But more generally, there is much, now much greater movement between universities and other research sites including research sites and NGOs and community organisations. There's also internationally been a very significant growth in what we might think of intermediary organisations, like the think tank that we will celebrate the opening of on Friday evening. People who are trying to combine 
academic knowledge with other forms of knowledge through new institutional forms. Now again, a trend with multiple impetuses. Some people say it's rampant commodification. Some of you might be familiar with Chris Shaw's writing on this. But as we can see from Friday, it's not as simple as that. It is also partly about multiple accountabilities and how we might address those multiple modes of accountability. Uh, so with the notion of knowledge exchange, I think we come much closer to an idea that we would feel more comfortable with, that somehow academic and non-academic knowledges are being more valued in this exchange, and we're beginning to learn from each other. Now, the third strand, and the one that I think people in this room are probably most familiar with, is that multiplicity of deeply embodied research practices, including communities of practice, action research, participatory research, uh, political activism, ethnographies, we got a new one this morning, that builds on the traditions of feminism, post-colonialism, uh, critical race, participatory action research praxis. And what, as many of you know, because you're doing this, researchers in this terrain are trying to do is really push community-oriented research beyond technocratic rationalities. And of course, this is where Maturanga Māori, and again, acknowledging Leone's comments earlier this morning, becomes really important. That what we need to have here is something that's not just about participation, but something where we are genuinely co-producing. We are all co-investigators, all expected to changing academic research practices and to contribute to the generation of theory. There is that expectation that research is done with, not to, external stakeholders. And this launches a very profound challenge to those orthodox boundaries between academics and activists. So what we need, as again you know in this space, is mutual and reciprocal learning between all the parties involved. We need to overcome those traditional understandings of the experts, those confident academics that Sue was describing, that privilege the academy. And interestingly, in the fields that I've been working, what we're also seeing a lot is a growing tendency to engage what I want to think about as beyond text tools, using arts, media, creativity, to facilitate that conversation and widen the audience. Now, these kinds of activities, if you begin to look hard and think about it, are being increasingly mainstreamed. This is one of the big shifts of the last de decade. They are increasingly being facilitated by funding models and regulatory instruments. So uh, in New Zealand, and again acknowledging Leone's comments about the problematic way in which this has been enacted, but the National Science Challenges explicitly position this emphasis on what I think of as co-production, but what uh, here often gets talked about as co-design, front and centre. And we can see it in a raft of other funding instruments as well. Now, lots of people are sceptical about those moves, and quite rightly, and we could be our good critical selves and talk about the withdrawal of public sector funding and what that has meant in the bigger picture. But again, what I want to underline is the fact that this is a much more heterogeneous terrain that we're operating in, and that there are very important opportunities to push at what I see as half-open doors. So, so let me give you a couple of examples where that kind of pushing at a half-open door I think has allowed some things to happen. And there are two examples that I personally have been involved in. 
So before I left the UK, in fact I'm still formally part of it, I was part of a major research project called Productive Margins that brought together a range of different academics from right across the humanities and social sciences and seven different community organisations, uh, including the established multi-generational multi national organisation, uh, like the Single Parents Action Network, who were part of this research project, through to new, uh, new generation, what I think of as millennial organisations, like Coexist, who I have been working with for about eight years, who were an umbrella group for about 800 different grassroots organisations attempting to be the change they wanted to see in the context of global environmental challenge and the growth of the social solidarity economy. Now, we were successful in a bid for a major research project that allowed us to co-produce research projects that address the regulatory challenges that marginalised communities faced. And it wasn't just the researchers who were funded. The community partners were fully funded for their time and a lot of the work that we were doing through that program was actually being done through peer researchers. So a, a single research project, but an example of the kind of research project that we're now beginning to see supported and funded. Second example, and again one that I've been explicitly involved in, some of you might know about the Antipode Foundation. It was established and funded by Antipode, a radical journal of geography of which I had the privilege of being the co-editor for a number of years. Now, amongst many other things, what we do is we fund a biannual academic activist institute for early career radical geographers, self-defined, we don't define what that means, and we also fund both academic activists and international collaboration, uh, collaboration building schemes in which we privilege solidarity building rather than individual academics in your projects. So if you apply as an individual academic saying, I want to do this, we're not going to fund you. What we are interested in are those transformational solidarity building initiatives. Every year we're hugely oversubscribed and I'm blown away, particularly by a new generation of academic activists who are seeking ways to support their efforts to change the world, to build those new relationships across sectors, communities and countries that we need. And I think Amanda and Dylan and their colleagues are fantastic examples of this new generation of scholars. So what I'm trying to suggest is that there is a really interesting opportunity for us. It's not more neoliberalism, and I will argue this till I'm blue in the face and I'm happy to do that in questions. Rather, what we're getting is a politically driven, ideas driven momentum that seeks alternative ways of knowing. That, to quote Marilyn Strathern, an anthropologist, appeals to the creative imagination in the promise to open up borders and cross new territories, even as, and again we heard it from Sue, these efforts raise big, hard, hard questions about ethical frameworks, established research approaches, what constitutes good research. So there's, it's, not a, it's not an unproblematic terrain, but it's terrain that is increasingly being occupied. And I think we need to both fight for that terrain, but also work to open it up even further. So I guess just to wrap up, what I'm saying is that I think there is a real shift going on. There is a really important moment where what we're seeing is a new chapter. A new chapter in the relationship between social movements and the academy, where social movement claims, broadly defined, for more accountable forms of knowledge are transforming universities. 
and we need to know much more about what this means for organisational forms, for intellectual labour, for subjectivities. So in my new role, I am naming this transformation and I am working to enhance it. I want to turn the university inside out, to use my friend's term, and I think uh, to, again, draw from Moana's comment, to hunger will be required. It will require us to work in new ways across really challenging boundaries for us. But those half-open doors are there and we need to push them open, both from the outside in and the inside out. Thank you very much.